<laughs> Om Namah Shivaya. I want to talk tonight about a core principle in Tantra, in non-dual Tantra, and that is the principle of Shiva Shakti, but something even beyond those two. So Shiva and Shakti, as you know, are not two discrete things. As is often the case, you know, these days, I think many people might make the mistake that Shiva is Shiva and Shakti is Shakti. So that there's like apparently a blue guy who sits and he meditates on the mat and he's distinct and separate from this lion riding, many armed, fearsome woman and that they are two entities. Not so in non-dual Shaiva theory, rather they are two principles and both of them are two aspects of one resultant principle, one higher principle. So I want to talk about that tonight. It's one of the deepest ideas, I think, in all of Indian philosophy, though I might be biased because I am speaking from within my tradition. But hopefully the proof will be in the pudding. When you hear about this idea, it's going to excite you quite as much as it excites me. And this idea typically gets many names, but typically it's called Para Bhairava, the Supreme Bhairava. Um, and there's wordplay there, the Bha, Ra, Va, they all mean something. Um, sometimes it gets called <laughs> Sometimes it gets called um, Para, uh, Paramashiva. Paramashiva is another common name for it. So Parabhairava, Paramashiva. Um, sometimes Sriman, Maheshwara. Sometimes just Shiva. But often when this particular phrase, Sriman, Maheshwara, or Parameshwara, Shri, 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 Parameshwara, when these phrases are invoked, they often imply some principle of non-duality that is a little bit different from the non-duality you might have heard about in the context of Advaita Vedanta, or even in some other schools of Shaivism, like Shaiva Siddhanta, or what have you. So this particular form of non-duality is what you might call a pure monism, or what you might call an absolute theism. It as its foundational principle takes theistic absolutism and spiritual realism, which are phrases that we will all unpack in the course of our journey together. So today, that's what we're talking about. Para Bhairava, the supreme Bhairava, or Shriman Maheshwara, the ultimate holder of resplendent glory, Lord Shiva, the great God. Uh, and and, and of, obviously none of this refers to the actual fella. Okay, we're talking about consciousness, we're talking about a philosophical principle, and that's what tonight will be about. So in talking about this, we're going to discuss Shiva and Shakti, but I want to phrase this as, what's the difference between Brahman and Shiva? And consequently, what's the difference between Maya and Shakti? So tonight's conversation is going to be very comparative, God willing. Um, we're going to look at Advaita Vedanta, which many of you are somewhat familiar with. Don't worry, we'll sketch out the basic principles if you're new. But we'll compare Advaita Vedanta with Tantra and show some key differences between the Parabhairava of Tantra, or, or rather Shaivism, and the um, Brahman of Advaita Vedanta. And these differences are very important because understanding these differences on a theoretical level can have vast effects for our practice, for our practical understandings. It's a very important discussion to have and in my opinion, a very nuanced discussion. So that being the case, we're going to look at some, some scriptural citation. I want to pick up one of the most important works on theoretical Shaivism ever, Abhinava Gupta's Ishvara Pratya Bhigya Vivritti Vimarshani, which is about as complex as it sounds. <laughs> Vivritti means commentary. So Vivritti means commentary on the recognition of God, who is none other than your own true self. So this is the commentary on God. <laughs> Timothy, if I tried to spell the name of this text, it would take the rest of the lecture. But don't worry, fortunately for you, I've already written out the name of the text prior to the lecture. Aha, I'm learning and I'll put it in the chat so now I can just copy and paste. Because what I want to do today, more than anything, is I want to like actually put some scripture in front of you. I want to show you actual verses from Abhinava Gupta, from these tantric texts, um, so we can hear it in their own language. I mean, these are the language, this is the language of like nectarian ecstasy wedded to piercing insight, as Christopher Wallace likes to say. Harish gives his beautiful phrase for a tantric Shaiva master, a person who embodies nectarian ecstasy, tremendous bhakti, a kind of deep divine intoxication, wedded to piercing insight, uncompromising intellect, logical precision. So it's a very special kind of mystic that we have here in Kashmir Shaivism, and that is the Pandit mystic, you know, the one who is able to actually articulate uh, very fine and subtle philosophies. And so it's a joy to study. But given that we, we're going to look at actual scripture and the precise articulations of these masters, to the best degree, I'm going to translate them to my best ability. But of course, much will obviously be lost in translation. Remember, translation is always interpretation. But I'm going to put the Sanskrit in front of you. So hopefully you, you know, those of you who know Sanskrit can come to your own conclusions. Anyway, we'll look at the Sanskrit and then we'll do a comparative study. Now, parts of this lecture might be a bit technical, uh, given that this is a rather nuanced discussion, as I said before. So it might in some places sound rather advanced, rather obscure. Insofar as that is true, let's take, a, like, let's take time today in Q&A and ask about any areas that weren't immediately clear. And if they're not immediately clear now, relax, let it go, they will be. 
Um, the key thing here is sadhana. These things become clearer and clearer as you progress in your practice. So as you deepen in meditation, the things that might have sounded obscure a year ago, today are crystal clear and are, are a matter of fact for you. You can immediately perceive the truth of what's being said here and now in your own experience. So as you practice, as you evolve in your sadhana, these theories actually take on more life. They take on more color. So before we get into it, I want to make two notes, two disclaimers. Okay, everyone ready for a 40 minute disclaimer section? No, I'm kidding. 10 minutes, I'm sure. God willing. Two disclaimers. The first is about philosophy itself in the Indic traditions. So philosophy, the task of discovering truth through the intellect is in India not quite what it is in the West. It's not actually even called philosophy, it's called darshana. Darshana um, means to see. So this is a way of seeing, rather it's a revelation, it's an insight. So darshana, Indian philosophy, okay, no less than 30 minutes. No, two will probably take two lectures, two disclaimers. Anyway, darshana means intuitive realization of some truth that is later as an afterthought clothed in language. So importantly, the philosophers of the Indic tradition have spiritual realizations first and then ad hoc reason about them. So they, after coming out of meditation, come up with ideas to describe what they've experienced. Why? Why would they take the trouble to do this? I mean, insofar as what they've experienced is in many ways beyond words, beyond the power of the intellect, beyond the power of language, why then bother to articulate it at all? And the answer is compassion. You know, Sri Ramakrishna gives that beautiful parable of the three uh, enlightened beings. So there's a wall and a boy climbs up and gazes over the wall and he sees something that makes him so happy. He shouts for joy. He jumps over the wall and disappears. I think he doesn't even shout. He just jumps over the wall and disappears. The second child climbs over the wall. He sees something really exciting and he starts to dance and cry out in joy and, and play around. And then he jumps over the wall and he's gone. The third boy climbs up. He sees what is a mart of joy, a mela, you know, a... Uh, beautiful scene of, of such ecstasy and he's just about to jump over the wall and, and, and engage he's just about to enter into this place but then he stops and he thinks what about everyone else in the village if I jump over the wall I might never come back they might never know that this is here they might miss out on the opportunity to enjoy this wonderful festival wait I'm gonna go back and tell them then we'll all come back that's the third kind of enlightened being so this is the kind of being who after meditation bothers to articulate to others what they've experienced and more importantly bothers to leave behind a, a, a practical manual for how they too can come to achieve it so these are like the world teachers the gurus and the bodhisattvas uh, avatars what have you so these beings like abhinava gupta the great shaiva master whose work we'll be studying today and of course other masters before abhinava gupta like utpala deva and, and, and numerous even abhinava gupta's father Nrsingha Gupta, we're going to study next week actually. I'm going to introduce you to a new type of non-duality called Pratyaksha Advaita, which means immediate non-duality. See, nowadays, because of much content on the internet, people are being exposed to this idea that hit herto was actually quite elite, and that's non-duality. Not a lot of people were exposed to non-duality, but typically, we're only exposed to one variety, variant, one form of non-duality, which is Shankara Advaita Vedanta. Right? But there are many different kinds. There's Valava's Shuddha Advaita, there's Nirsing, uh, uh, I almost said Nirsing Avatara, but Nirsingha Gupta, Abhinava Gupta's fathers, Pratyaksha Advaita. Today, I'm going to tell you about Param Advaita. There's many different kinds of Advaita. Okay? So, insofar as that is true, these masters are like that third kind, of enlightened being who bother to say something about what they experienced. But I have to stress here at the top of the lecture that the beginning of these philosophies is intuitive spiritual realization. So these insights come not through logic or reasoning, but through meditation. So this cannot be stressed more. Meditation is the seed of all that we're going to talk about today. Every insight that you're going to hear about today is basically a description of what a master is experiencing in meditation and what they're realizing as a result of that experience. So it's a kind of science in, in, insofar as these masters have developed what Patanjali would call Samyama. Now, those of you who read the Yoga Sutra, if you see in book three, Vibhudipada, there's a list of things that you can do in Vibhudipada. If you want to learn how to, I don't know, talk to animals, they teach you how to do that. If you want to learn how to disappear and become invisible, they also teach you how to do that in the third book of the yogas. Now, now everyone's going to go and buy a copy. It's not so easy because in order to access all that stuff in Vibhudipada, which by the way is an obstacle to enlightenment, the Yoga Sutra itself, book 3 verse 38 and book 3 verse 51, both I think will say these are obstacles. But anyway, it gives you a thing, a tool, it's called Samyama which is Dharana Dhyana Samadhi, which basically means deep meditation. So this is the telescope or rather the magnifying glass. It's the actual instrument 
a mental instrument that a yogi uses to investigate these subtle truths about the universe that's inherent within the, the spiritual experience. So these yogis that we're going to be talking about have this tool, okay? O over years and years, over incarnation after incarnation, they develop this meditative depth called samyama. And in deep meditation, they're using this tool, samyama, to investigate fine and subtle realities, which are later clothed in philosophical form. So that being the case, I don't want anyone here to think that this is an intellectual exercise, though it's going to become pretty intellectual in just a few moments. Okay, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to start making a few nuanced intellectual arguments comparing two philosophies. It's going to sound pretty brainy, pretty geeky. I should have worn my glasses today so I could push them up the bridge of my nose and say, huh? And I should have brought my inhaler so I can like, you know, I don't know why asthma came to be associated. Like, but I, I'm going to just put on my wheezy scholar hat in a little bit. But although this stuff is going to sound a little geeky, a little yeah, nerdy. Hello, Tara. Ma, I missed you. A little geeky, a little nerdy, a little intellectual. Um, don't 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 think that's all it is. It's not. It's its root is spiritual realization. So that tells us two things. One, it tells us that logic can only take you so far, but it's not entirely without purpose. So this, this thing we must always know. You know, some people say, what's the point in reasoning? What's the point in thinking? And then you know what will happen to them? They get snapped up by some cult of personality and they become, I don't know, in some cult or, or they become religious bigots and I don't know, they, I don't know. Like scary things happen when you give up your intellect. You get easily manipulated. And often their practice also is not very effective because they don't have clearly defined goals for their practice. Why don't they have clearly defined goals for their practice? And not only that, they don't have clear measurements or yardsticks for whether or not their practice is improving. So even if we grant them that they are practicing, it's actually dangerous because when that practice works, they won't know it's working. When that practice is not working, they won't know how to course correct. And they won't even know when they get there, if they get there. All of this sounds like a recipe for disaster. It's like being a pilot and setting out to go to Tokyo from London but you don't care where Tokyo is and you don't look at any maps or you don't you're just like I'm just gonna God's will I'm, I'm, I'm kitten God will do it I don't need to think what what need have I of reason mother you just take no 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 on, on a certain level if you're too quick to say mother take away my reason you're doomed you know the plane will crash or you'll end up in worse worse than the plane crashing you'll end up in a city that you didn't intend to go to so if you just practice if you just go ham and practice 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 but you have no theory whatsoever informing your practice you will a not know when you get there if you ever get there two you will have no clear measurement for whether or not you're progressing and three you will have no way to course correct if indeed your practice is not working so that's why intellect is very important so logic has a purpose in your own sadhana that's one another reason logic is valuable is because it helps you articulate in a reasonable and articulate way uh, that can help others so the deep desire in humanity, arguably, is to share what we found. And that's a desire that India has never been able to suppress. We've never hid behind some kind of obscure alchemical poem and hinted at enlightenment. We've just come out and said it, you know, in the most direct way possible. Look at Swami Vivekananda. We've come out and said it, and we've come out and said it to everybody. We grab everyone by the shoulders and with wild-eyed ecstasy, we say, do you know what I found? And you can find it too. Come, let's sit together. You see, that's the, that's the spirit of the Indian spiritual master. And arguably all spiritual masters, look at Socrates, look at Jesus. But in any case, insofar as that's true, we need um, some language, some tool. And that's logic, that's reason, that's the Sanskrit language. We use that as a way to convey to others for their own benefit. And arguably, since everyone is nothing other than Divine Mother manifested, it's a kind of prayer to give to others this philosophy that we ourselves experience in meditation. These are the two reasons why logic is very important, why, why reasoning is very important. The, but, but then also we must, as a disclaimer, acknowledge that um, there's only so much reasoning can do. There's only so far you can go with just the mind. So insofar as that is true, I want to introduce you to an important word today. And that word is this, let me put it here, sat tarka. Now tarka in Sanskrit just means reasoning. And there are many Sanskrit proverbs that characterize reasoning as groundless. If you just reason, you'll end up going in circles. You'll just go in circles and circles and circles. Reasoning doesn't really go anywhere. Kant, the German philosopher Kant, he demonstrated in one text, uh, antinomians. So Kant antinomianism is a kind of way to show the self-defeating nature of reasoning. If you argue with someone, you might end, end up arguing forever. And the Buddhists and the Vedantins have been arguing for thousands and thousands of years. There's no clear end to this debate and it goes in circles. So reasoning, pure reasoning on its own, often deludes you and often confuses you. It creates more words rather than less words. So 
This is the kind of reasoning that Sri Ramakrishna often advises people not to do, that many spiritual masters discourage against. Reasoning for the sake of controversy. In Swami Vekananda's Raja Yoga, he says, uh, at a certain point this is valuable. I mean, Swami Vekananda himself was an ardent debater when he was a kid. Um, and he really much enjoyed just disproving other points of view that he felt were not aligned to truth. So he was a debater and he liked to argue controversies and stuff like that. So there's a time and place for this, you know. And he says, up to a point, this is good for you. It's called vada, meaning debating against schools. But once you come to a clear conviction of truth, meaning once you know that God alone satisfies and the world is but a false fruit, once you know that, then there's no reason to engage in controversies. Then you go from vada to siddhanta, which means you start only reading or only interacting not with controversial arguments, arguing, arguing for the sake of arguing, but in clarifying the intellect for the sake of practice. So Swami Vivekananda makes a distinction between Vada and Siddhanta. Here, Abhinava Gupta is about to make that same distinction between Tarka and Sat Tarka. So Tarka is any kind of reasoning that is um, you know, worldly. You're doing it maybe to win against someone else or win an argument. You're doing it because you're getting some kind of intellectual thrill from it, and that's the reason. So even an intellectual thrill is a kind of sensuality, you know, it's still a kind of Vishayananda, an objective pleasure. So this is what Abhinava Gupta would call Tarka, ordinary reasoning. And Tarka is good for things like Western philosophy. Entire Western philosophy is based on Tarka, with a few exceptions, but most Western philosophy is something that you do with just your intellect, you know, with a few exceptions, of course. Now, Sat Tarka, Sat means true. So Abhinava Gupta's Sat Tarka is a special type of reasoning. It's basically Tarka plus one other thing, Sat, meaning reality. So I would say, just to keep this simple, Sat Tarka is any type of reasoning you do post-meditation or uh, any type of reasoning that's informed by sadhana, informed by meditation. Okay, so this, insofar as we're going to now enter into philosophical territory in this series, I just want you to know up front that what, what we're using is Sat Tarka, not Tarka. And the reason I have to give you this disclaimer is because some things might sound pretty contradictory. So Sat Tarka allows a sort of poetic license to maybe not be as logically constrained as Tarka would be. I once asked a guy on TikTok, um, what, he was like an atheist kind of guy, you know, and he was just so certain that Aristotelian syllogisms were the laws of the universe. I'm like, so, you know, to what extent is this a religion? You just believe in this Aristotelian syllogisms, you know, the principle of non-contradiction. If something is A, it cannot not be A. What? So some guys at some point in history just made an axiom that said, if something is A, it cannot, not, it cannot also be not A at the same time. And you just accept that. That axiom is somehow a law of the universe. That's weird, isn't it? So there's a certain constraint that Western syllogistic logic has. Um, and it doesn't do well when it comes to these spiritual truths that many of them are inherently paradoxical. They're not actually that paradoxical if you can understand them on several levels of being, meaning something might be true for the body which is untrue for the mind, something might be true for the mind which is untrue for the spirit, like that. So in the maybe relative plane, Arjuna, Duryodhana, they all have free will. But in the absolute plane, none of them have free will. So the answer is they both have free will and don't have free will. How do you make sense of this paradox? Well, you just understand to which level each is applied. However, if you have no access to the absolute and you're only in the relative, this will be a paradox. So again, this is kind of some direction in Indian philosophy as to how to resolve paradox. If something seems paradoxical, it's only because you don't have access to some deeper level of experience that resolves the paradox. The way to resolve paradox in Indian philosophy is to see to which level a particular statement applies and to which level its opposite applies. Okay, maybe that's a lecture for a different day. Um, but in any case, Sat Tarka will deal with some paradoxes that might be an affront to basic syllogistic logical thinking. It's a new type of logic that we're going to be dealing with here. However, it still appeals to the reason, it can still be tested, it can still be verified, much like Tarka. Though, it cannot be tested, it cannot be verified if you aren't meditating. Therefore, last week, I wanted to spend the whole time just discussing the role of yoga in Indian philosophy. Unfortunately, because of a Zoom glitch, we lost that lecture. So, it's not available for viewing anymore. Those of you who came, I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> But th this is the gist of it. If you're not meditating, it's very difficult for you to manifest and actualize these philosophies in your life, let alone understand them. So meditation is a given, okay? As we continue together, I'm going to become philosophical, but I'm just going to presuppose that everyone is deepening their sadhana, practicing, etc. Okay, that's the first disclaimer. Second disclaimer. Oh my god, this is taking some time. <laughs> Second disclaimer. The first disclaimer is Satarka is different from Tarka. <laughs> so we're going to do some kind of logic here. The second disclaimer is... 
while we're going to do some comparative work, this is the same disclaimer we offered at the beginning of the series, while we're going to do some comparative work between a bunch of different schools of philosophy, don't ever get the impression that one is right and the others are wrong. Rather, they are stages of realization. So different schools of philosophy are not different takes on truth. They're just the same truth experienced at different levels of your spiritual journey. Is that fair? This is a very important principle. Schools of Indian philosophy are not in contradiction with one another. They're all of them true, each according to their particular specific level of realization. So in the beginning, you might have one realization. In the end, you might have another. They might seem to contradict, but they don't. They just refer to different parts of the journey. Truth, ultimate truth, is beyond all of this, and yet is experienced in all of these greater ways. That's the second disclaimer I want to make. Because I'm going to start debating now, I don't want you to get the impression that I'm going to take one side. You know, I'm going to say, oh, I'm a Kashmiri Shaiva, therefore Advaita Vedanta is wrong. No, I mostly teach Advaita Vedanta here, right? I, and, and many people will think I'm a, I'm a devout Maya Vadin. Often I'm saying the world is unreal. Why? Because it's very helpful to use that philosophy. However, ultimately, insofar as my own experiences and my own study and my own tradition is concerned, ultimately I'm a Kashmiri Shaiva, but it's not because I think Kashmiri Shaivism is right and that Mayavada is wrong, I just think they apply to different stages in a person's sadhana. Okay, so even though I'm going to take a bit of a debating tone for the rest of the lecture, don't get the impression that one is right and the others are wrong. They're just different stages of experience. Okay, disclaimers out of the way, let's start. Now I don't know where to start. <laughs> <laughs> okay, progressive stages of realization. The first stage of realization in the journey of a human life is this. The world is here. Oh, thank you, Amanda. Okay, that fixed it. Okay, we go. <laughs> the, the first realization that we have together as human beings in this spiritual journey is this. The world exists. You know? Here is a world. That's the first realization. There is a world. And it's kind of a powerful realization actually because it encourages some form of action if there is a world i should interact with it no how should i interact with it given that there is a world and given that i am here in this world what am i to make of it what am i to make of my life what am i to do with the time that i have here so often people will just default to the cultural programming that was handed to them by their forefathers so it's almost like all throughout the human race there's been this manual that's being passed down from mother to daughter from mother to son etc from father to son from father to daughter like this book is being handed down and it has a few rules in it rules that are totally artificial like you have to make a lot of money um you have to i don't know be respectable and wear your shoes and i, I don't know like a bunch of rules and because we don't know what to do we gladly accept this rule book and we live according to it so our religion becomes a religion of convention so for many of us when we enter into the world and we have this realization there is a world we merely default to convention what is convention it's ultimately worldliness so if you look at what the, the deep values of society are, meaning why people do what they do, you'll find that they often have something to do with money or power or sex, right? So often people go to college, not really to acquire learning for learning's sake, but often because they want to secure a good job. And the cultural convention says by going to college, you'll be able to get a good job. Why do people want a good job? Because they want money. But what's the purpose of money? Well, for options, to be able to travel, to be able to you know, live in a nice apartment, mostly for security, for freedom. You know, money gives you freedom. So the, the pursuit here is the pursuit of freedom. But the rule book says the way to get freedom is to get into a good college, get a good job, and then make a good salary. Okay. Then we enter into the convention of marriage, or if not marriage, some other social contracts, maybe as a, as a community, as a neighborhood watch, what have you, families like that. So we enter into these social contracts, and then we have lousy Thanksgiving dinners where we're all upset at each other because of something someone said two years ago. Anyway, this is the first stage of realization. A world exists, and I am in this world to achieve some form of freedom, and the only way that I can find that freedom is through the gratification of my senses, the acquiring of wealth, and the acquiring of power. So for most of us, our understanding is this. The more power I have, the more money I have, the more pleasurable experiences I can collect, the happier I will be. In other words, the freer I will be. Notice our notions of happiness are tied up with freedom. I want money because money, I think, will make me feel free. It'll give me options that not having money won't. Right? So that's why I want money. I want pleasure. Or I want experiences because it will give me some sense of freedom, like traveling or something like that. Okay, so th th these are all things that most of us are conditioned to want and most of us are seeking out. Even if most of us aren't able to articulate that this is what we want or that this is what we're seeking, this is the um, underlying impulse behind almost everything that we do. This, 
according to Shaivism, is a valid state of realization. This is a valid spiritual state. It's called Charvaka. Charvaka means materialist. So a Charvaka is one who doesn't accept any higher realities beyond this material world. Basically like an atheist materialist, a, a realist, you know. A Charvaka says, this world is all I can be sure of, so I might as well live in it in a practical way, which means I might as well get some money, I might as well get as much pleasure as I can. So this typically degenerates into hedonism because that's kind of the convention is you want money for pleasure like that. So typically, but it doesn't have to. It can also be a kind of humanitarianism. It could be ethical. It could be a kind of realist materialist ethics and you live in the world to help others like there, there are more noble forms of this and there are certainly degenerate forms of this but in any case this is i want to stress here at the beginning of the lecture the part of the lecture after the disclaimers where i think in my mind it's the beginning but it's actually 40 minutes in okay i don't even want to look at the time so <laughs> it, here at the top of my idea of what this lecture is i want to introduce you to this as a valid spiritual experience it's called the experience of charvaka basically and i'm just going to use some shaiva language now basically this is accepting shakti without having any understanding of shiva whatsoever so most of us start with shakti oh, thank you amanda actually it's not so bad i think i can I don't know, mother's will. So let, this is the first understanding that this is fine. This is one way to worship God, actually. It's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with this. And this is actually quite wonderful for many incarnations. So actually, you can really enjoy this for a while. Like in, innumerable lives can be spent, like chasing orgasms. Orgasms are great. They're wonderful. Have them. You know, chocolate cake, delicious. Eat it. Um, I don't know. Traveling is wonderful. Go to Macau. <laughs> I don't know, do whatever you want to do. This world is like a playground, right? And you got to do everything in it that seems fascinating to you to do. So like, if you want to be a rock and roll musician, go try that. If you want to be a philanthropist, go to, I don't know, some sub-Saharan African NGO and do that. And like, it's wonderful. All of this is so cool, right? I remember building, we, we once did a, like a volunteer thing in Bali, Penastana, Bali. And it was so valuable those few years, like building that school. It was just so cool. I had so much fun. And, and we look back upon it fondly. Like these things are all valuable experiences in life. Go and have them, you know? And maybe your whole life is devoted to just that. So this is the first stage of realization. It's when Shakti blesses us with a series of experiences that enrich our lives. There's nothing wrong with any of this. There's no moralizing or condescending that needs to happen here. Insofar as a person wants to worship God as a charvaka, they are free to do so and that they're actually encouraged to do so in Shaivism. <laughs> because why would the world appear at all? if not to be experienced. In fact, this is an argument we get even in Sankhya. So if you see Swami Vivekananda's commentary on the Yoga Sutra, he goes back to this idea a lot. And it's one of the, the core ideas of Sankhya. And I don't think I need to repeat myself since we, you know, we, we did a lot of that discussion already in the What is Shiva lecture. So I don't need to tell you about the principles of Sankhya or anything right now. I probably will because I can't help myself, but for now I won't. So um, we know that in Sankhya, Prakriti, this creation appears actually for the sake of Purusha. So it's there to give Purusha experiences that culminate in liberation. So insofar as Purusha comes into contact with Prakriti, Sankhya actually makes us like sort of an argument that Prakriti is helping Purusha. Now, I don't have it with me. It's kind of nice to quote directly from it, but Swami Vivekananda at the very end of his commentary on Kaivalya Pada, the Yoga Sutra commentary that Swamiji does, he actually talks about Prakriti in the language of Tantra. He calls her mother. And he says, mother is holding our hand and guiding us through all these incarnations until finally she takes us to freedom. And then she lets us go and goes back for the others. It's a beautiful depiction. And it's the Kashmiri Shaiva depiction that this whole universe is just mother. And so actually mother um, gives stuff and all that stuff is wonderful. I'm debating whether or not I, okay, I'll tell you one time I was praying in a very powerful Shakti temple and I was praying to mother, how, how will I experience um, you like how will I experience you in every place in every circumstance in every um, situation if that's the epitome of spiritual life the ability to feel your presence everywhere and everywhere how will I know that you're here how will I feel your presence and just as I articulated that thought someone came up behind me stranger and by the way like the puja is well over with everyone's dispersed and I'm just standing there before the murti so someone just strides across the temple, stranger approaches me and whispers in my ear, don't forget to eat some prasad. And that was like a huge realization for me because how will I feel mother's grace? It's the person telling me to eat the sweet rice in the corner of the temple. And then I, I was thinking like mother gives sweet rice. This world is full of pleasure. 
And that's the first gift that mother gives, you know, the, the, the joy of, of living, the simple joy of being. And this is, of course, something I need to articulate. The Bohemians and, you know, all the artists of 20th century France have argued for it ad infinitum that, you know, just Bohemian it up, you know, like live your life, etc. Okay, now this is a good understanding, actually, in the beginning. So this is one way to, to worship God, just Shakti without Shiva. This is the lowest realization, but it's still a valid realization. And it's the one that most of us are currently having. So most of us are at this stage. Yeah, like it could be an Epicureanism, you know, this idea that this world is real. It's really, really real. Um, and everything in it is real. And if it's real, it's valuable for me to go out and get it. So if money is real, I should go and get it. You know, if, if, so for instance, you, if someone comes to you and say money is unreal, now give me all of your money, something's wrong there, right? Pay me $500 to tell you that money is not real. What? That something is weird there. But if money is real, then it's worth getting, it's worth taking from others. <laughs> so you do that. Um, if pleasure is real, then it's worth having, it's worth entering into relationships, it's worth all this stuff. However, here's the next realization. And this too, mother gives. The next realization is, um, okay, but I'm not happy. So the next realization is having tasted everything, having acquired everything, having experienced almost every possible experience, eventually you come to the conclusion that it's not bringing you any closer to joy. So let's just take the case of orgasms, right? Have some really good orgasms. And then a week later, ask the question, am I meaningfully made happier by that orgasm last week? You have to ask that question, you know, because I would say an orgasm is a peak experience for most people. And so most people, whether they know it or not, are living for the sake of having orgasms. And, and as good as they might be, they're fleeting. They're like a flash in the night. They come and they go. And notice a week later, you don't feel like you are meaningfully enriched by that experience. You know, insofar as that's true, you might pursue it again. Good. Go for it again. But then realize that you're not meaningfully enriched again. And then say some people want to travel, right? Travel the whole world. And then ask yourself a year after your last really important vacation, if you're truly meaningfully enriched. If you say yes, fine, that's good. You're still in the Charvaka stage. Keep going, you know, keep tasting. But I think most of you here, arguably most people in the world are sooner or later going to come to this. And nowadays, more and more people are coming to this more quickly because of how easily accessible many pleasures are. You know, back then you would spend your whole life to be able to have one pleasure. Now in a day, you could have 10 pleasures that your ancestors might have had, had to spend 10 incarnations. So because people can access pleasure so easily, kind of like Buddha, you know, Prince Gautama and his pleasure garden, kind of like that, because you're able to access a plethora of pleasures at a click away on your phone, more and more people are waking up to this fact that pleasure does not satisfy. You know, there's a beautiful story at the end of the Bhagavatam of a king who, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a weird story. He was getting old and he realizes that he, he hadn't yet satisfied his desires because nobody gets to the end of their life and decides that they've satisfied their desires. But anyway, he felt like cheated, cheated by death. So he asked his sons, will one of you loan me out your body? Because he has his mantra that allows him to go into a younger person's body. His eldest son gladly offers up his body and they switch bodies, kind of like a Freaky Friday situation. So they switch bodies. The, older, the, the eldest son enters the old man king's body and the old man king enters the young boy's body. And now the king has another, I don't know, 50 or so years to enjoy pleasure. And he does it. So he enjoys pleasure. He, you know, all manner of kingly pleasures. And when he gets to the end of his life, this is what he says. It's very harrowing. This is an insight, not from one lifetime of pleasure, but two very close together lifetimes of pleasure. And this is his insight, deep insight. Trying to satisfy yourself by fulfilling desires is like trying to pour ghee on a fire, expecting the fire to go out. So ghee is the butter. Imagine trying to put out a fire with oil. You know, if you're trying to put out the fire with oil, it'll just become a more raging fire. So sooner or later, you realize satisfying desires is not the way to end desires. I'll never be enough money. I'll never be enough pleasure. And if you get a lot of money, and a lot of pleasure, you'll eventually feel like you haven't really gotten anything. So here we can introduce another phrase, the difference between a horizontal being and a vertical being. I think this is from Shivananda Saraswati. I think, I think this is his language. I'm not sure though. So Shivananda Saraswati offers this. Some people are horizontal beings. Okay, meaning they have a lot of stuff. They have a lot of experiences, but they don't experience real genuine fulfillment. They don't yet have depth. So the goal now, having explored the horizontal plane, meaning having experienced this material worldly life, the goal now is to find something rich, deep, meaningful. So now, becomes the, now, now comes the vertical quest which you could even say it's the inward journey. So having looked outward and been thoroughly disappointed, now you start to look inward. So this is the second phase of the journey. It's called the spiritual quest, 
So this is the next gift that mother gives. First, mother gives you world experiences. Then she, through her own grace, causes in you the feeling of distaste for them. You know, when that's going to show up in a person's life, who can say? Some people go their whole life and some people from the very early ages of their life, they realize they don't need sex. They don't need money. You know, it, we're all at a different stage with this and we have no control. Mother somehow embodies herself as this realization that um, I'm not really going to be satisfied in this world. Now, if you look at the TikToks that I make that say this, see how angry people get about this point. Because here's what I'm going to thank you, Tara. Here's what I'm, I'm ultimately trying to say. And this is the thing that I want to hold fast with the most conviction. There is no experience that I can have in this world with any of my senses that will ever permanently satisfy me. What I'm looking for is not available in relationships, in money, in pleasure, and in power. There is nothing I can get from anyone or from any experience that will ever lastingly fulfill me. I should stop trying. Okay, this is the conviction I need to have. And it's coupled with another conviction. The thing that I do want that I truly, truly want is not out there in the world, but it is in here in me, in the form of God, in the form of self. And the way to get it is through spiritual practice. If I know this, if I have this conviction, it should actually express itself in the way that I use my time. So if you want to test to what degree you've had this realization, just look at how you spend your day. Or better yet, look at what thoughts you have throughout the day. If your thoughts are about acquiring pleasure, power, wealth, then obviously you've, you've still got a little charvaka stuff left to do. You're still not yet sure about this. And re reasonably, you're going to be angry if I say this. That's why on TikTok, when I tell people like, this is the way, they're like, no, that's so world negating. And it's true. From that point of view, from the Charvaka point of view, this is a manifest untruth. This sounds like suicide because what I'm suggesting here is in many ways disturbing. I'm saying that your life is meaningless. Only God is meaningful. You know, so it's kind of disturbing. Anyway, for some people that naturally arises and once that conviction comes, the next discovery is like sadhana. You do, you do spiritual practice. You go through a, a series of practices. You subscribe to schools. You like do, do these things. Okay, good. Now you have your first spiritual realization. So I would say this is the third realization, right? Realization number one, the world exists. I'm going to live in it. Realization number two, the world exists. It sucks. Yelp review, two stars. Um, I'm going to go for God. I don't know about that, but it's the last ditch attempt I have at meaning in this life. I'm going to try it. Now realization number three, oh my God, God rocks. It works. There's something. There is that infinite principle and it's called, yeah, too much pay, too much pay to play <laughs> one star. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Worst pay to play first person shooter ever. Anyway, so this is the first spiritual realization and this is the realization of Sankhya. So through deep meditation or through devotional practices or through any number of practices, eventually you'll come to this conclusion. There exists some transcendent principle um, and this we call in Shaivism Shiva. So thus far, we've only interacted with Shakti, right? So in the realm of Shakti, you had pleasure, power, wealth. Then in the realm of Shakti, you did spiritual practices, which are all Shakti oriented. I mean, you have to use the body, you have to use the mind, you have to use the breath. The books themselves that you're reading are in Maya, in Shakti, you know? So everything is all Shakti. And then finally, you, you come to experience Shiva. Now here, I don't mean as a concept. Your concept about Shiva is still, a, uh, still in Shakti. It's still in this realm. It's still a material experience. Rather, I'm talking about an actual tangible experience of consciousness being distinct from its objects. So this we covered in depth in the last lecture. In depth, if I may say so myself, in the last lecture. Two weeks ago, I mean, what is Shiva? In that lecture, we articulated Shiva as consciousness distinct from the contents of consciousness. This is perhaps the most important message that I, I have to share with most people. And I'll never get tired of sharing it. But today, I'm just going to move past it. You know, and, and it's this, you are not the body, you are not the mind, you are not any of the contents of the mind, you are consciousness, wholly distinct and wholly apart from all of those. This is a thrilling discovery, actually. And it's far beyond an intellectual idea. It's an, it's an experience. It's an actual embodied realization that what I am is wholly irrespective of what's moving in this space. What's happening in the mind, what's happening in the body, what's happening in the world is not happening to me. Once that realization comes, we call this Kaivalya or V-Yoga, Prakriti Purusha V-Yoga. So meaning nature and soul have become discombobulated. No, what you call it? Disentangled. Now I'm combobulated. No, now I'm discombobulated, right? So I've gotten mixed up. Me, Purusha, the conscious that I am, has gotten mixed up with Prakriti. And as a result, I think I'm the body and mind. And I think this world is like, I'm in it. But actually then I realized after a deep meditation, 
I have this nirvikalpa samadhi experience, ideally, in which I feel consciousness standing alone, naked and pure. And I realize myself is that. Tada drashtu swarupe avastanam. Then that's the end of all my problems. Okay, now the lecture begins in earnest. So now is where a series of philosophies are going to emerge. And the reason they emerge is because, as I said in the beginning of this class, the reason they emerge is because um, my absorption in that, you spelled it right, brother. My absorption in that consciousness is deepening as I continue to visit it. So the first time, let's say we enter into Nirvikalpa Samadhi, the first touch of that might result in something like Kaivalya, something like Purusha Prakriti Viyoga. And I might articulate this discovery in a very Sankhyan way. I might say, here is the world. In it, there are five elements. There are five subtle elements. In it, there are five organs of action. There are five organs of perception. There is the mind, there is the ego, there is the memory, and there is the intellect. And all of that, this world called Prakriti is over there. It's distinct from me. And I, consciousness, stand alone in my own resplendent, effulgent freedom. I, Purusha, pure, have always been pure, will always be pure, and even am now pure. And I am wholly, wholly free and distinct from that which I previously thought I was. This, this is the first realization, right? Now, remember in the What is Shiva lecture, we offered this statement that consciousness is synonymous with bliss. So there's something about consciousness that is blissful. So when one enters into deep meditation, the joy that one feels there is so unlike any of the joy in the world and so much better, so much purer, so much deeper that sooner or later, you'll just want that more. So because you know, most of us were motivated, you know, I think some philosopher called it the pleasure principle. We're motivated to towards joy, towards fulfillment, towards that which makes us feel good. Once you taste this, this spiritual joy, you lose your taste for worldly joy. Because if you want joy, you're going to want greater joy as opposed to worse. Or you compare the two, you just, it's no longer tenable for you to pursue joy that's no longer that good. It's, it's a very simple principle. You gave up playing with Lego blocks, some of you, when you discovered your investment portfolios, right? So you're much more happy, you, you spend much more time now trying to make money because that, that brings you more reward than playing with your Legos, which as a child, you really love to do. So some higher, more fulfilling pleasure will always trump some lower pleasure. So this is typically what happens in the Shaiva master, okay? They, they sit in meditation. This is Shaivism, so it's very meditation oriented. They sit in meditation. Remember Shiva is, is the symbol of meditation. Sit in meditation. They have this first experience called Nirvikalpa Samadhi, which if you're interested in having, this is what the Yoga Sutra is for. It teaches you just that, how to achieve this. And most of us are practicing for something like this. So you have this experience. You notice that Purusha is distinct from Prakriti. And then when you come out of that experience, you are emboldened by your discovery. Now you move about in the world as one who has nothing to lose and nothing to gain. So a basic sense of renunciation comes into your life as a result of sensing this difference, okay? Now, what are you going to spend your time doing, though? Probably meditating. <laughs> because you understand that I'm not body and mind, you don't then, as, as a result, spend a lot of time moving around the world as a body and mind. What do you have to gain by that? You know, what do you have to achieve? What do you have to do? So in, in, instead of doing that, in other words, instead of doing your life, you just sit there. Don't just do something, sit there. You know, you just sit there and you meditate, you meditate. And you start to go deeper and deeper and deeper into this experience. Meaning your samadhi ripens. It means your samadhi becomes richer, deeper, fuller. You become more and more immersed in this infinite purusha. And it's so thrilling because it seems to be, there's no end to it. The more you meditate, the deeper and richer the bliss becomes. So the more you want to meditate. And the more you want to meditate, the more of this infinity you start to experience. Now, when you come out, the world seems a little different. It's like when you're in a dark room, or maybe no, I, I don't know what the metaphor would be. Okay, if you're in a very bright room, like a super bright room, and then you walk out of the bright room and you enter into a dark room, you won't be able to see anything. But if you were in a dark room and then you enter into a similarly dark room, you'll be able to see stuff, right? Okay, this is like the comparison between the Advaita Vedanta insight and the Sankhya insight. In Sankhya, let's start with Sankhya. In Sankhya, you have an experience of consciousness, but it's not that deep yet. So you're kind of in like a dark room. And then you enter a slightly darker room and you can still make out some objects. So there appears to be in your experience two rooms, right? Now, in the Advaita Vedanta realization, which is just a matter of a deeper samadhi, in a deeper samadhi, you're entering into something like a bright room. Now the room is bright, so it's so bright that when you exit that bright room, the second room is completely black. 
you know this phenomenon you won't be able to see anything anymore because you're so used to the bright luminosity of that first room the second room appears virtually non-existent right Ah, oh, so that's why in Advaita Vedanta, we say that the world is an illusion because that's actually what it feels like. You know, when you step out of that deep samadhi and you enter back into the world, you look around and everything has a kind of shadowy quality. Why? Because it's now held up in contrast to um, something deeper. And you know what that deeper thing is? Samadhi. That, that samadhi feels more real than the world and therefore you dismiss the world as relatively less real, relatively unreal. Now, if you do move about in the world, a few things. One, you could maybe not move. You could just be like Gaurapada, sit in deep meditation and be absorbed. Or you could be like one of those, you know, Zogjen, crazy wisdom people who walk around the world. You're like, ah, ah, ah. It's all a magical display. It's all just fancy. It, it, it feels that way, you know? This is not like uh, just something clever to say. It actually, when you look around, you don't feel like anything is substantial and therefore it's all delightful. Even scenes of horror, it's like watching a theatrical performance or something. But, and, and this is very eerie. I think most people find this a very eerie and disconcerting state um, to say you could look at some horror and laugh. Yeah, you will. Because if you have this deep experience of reality, meaning in samadhi, and you come into this, it doesn't feel quite as real. It's impossible for you to take it as seriously prior to samadhi. Okay. Okay. So let's move on. So that's why in Advaita Vedanta, we say this world is unreal. And now we make a series of arguments as to why that's the case. And we make, make arguments, right? We say, okay, the world is changing. Something that is changing cannot be real. Why? Because for something to be true, for something to be sat, it must be changeless. Just look at your own experience. If someone says something to, to you today, and then tomorrow contradicts that, you'll say they're fake. You'll say they're a fraud. Notice how your notions of realness is tied up to eternity. Something must have eternity for it to be true, for it to be real. If something changes, it is therefore not true and not real. Given that this world is nothing but change, it can be nothing but unreal. You see, we can make arguments like that, but these arguments are post the fact. And do you know why these arguments work? They work because, as Abhinava Gupta would say, they are shuddha vikalpas. They work because they do actually map on to something true which is the, this realization, the world is unreal. So you can actually even, if you don't have samadhi in this lifetime, you can actually even just take it on faith. Ashtavakra says so, have faith in this, my child, at least in this, do not be bewildered. You are God beyond nature, you know? So you can have faith, actually. You can just believe this. I mean, this is seemingly blasphemy to say, but Ashtavakra himself says, have faith, my child. The world is not real. It's not. Everything you think is such a big deal, it's not. You're guilty. I'm sorry, but what you're guilty about never happened. Okay, there's no past. There's no such thing as the past. Give it up. It's not real. Really, it's not real. Just believe that. The future that you're worried about is not real. Your life is not real. If you don't believe me, wait. <laughs> wait. Just get to the end of it. Look back on all of it. It will feel like a dream. All these things you're taking so seriously now, just wait. You look back on all of it, your children, your family. Honestly, it feels like a big deal. It's not. This world is not real. And you can take that on faith. And that might actually drastically alter the way you live, but it's unlikely because this faith is not um, that durable. Your faith in the world is a little stronger than your faith in what some crazy people in the scriptures and on the internet are saying, right? Your faith in your experience is better. And I think that's better to go off of that. It's better to go off what you experience as true as opposed to what you heard was true. Just know that it is possible to go off what you heard. Nisargadath Maharaj, when asked about how he attained enlightenment, actually said, uh, my guru told me. My guru told me I was Brahman. I believed him and I acted accordingly. Can you imagine? Just somebody tells you, you are Brahman right now. Right now, you are Brahman. You are infinite. You are the source of all bliss. If you believe that and act accordingly, what else is left to do? Nisargadath Maharaj actually says that was the case with him. Obviously, you know, here we'll say he put in a lot of sadhana and he had a guru and previous lives, he must have been working really hard. But be that as it may, if it might be possible for some of us to just hear it once, to just believe in it and to just act accordingly without even necessarily having samadhi. And then as a result, samadhi comes of its own, you know, just eventually arises or it doesn't, it doesn't matter. In any case, to be able to have that belief though requires a conviction and requires an insight that most of us don't have. We might actually believe, but we won't be able to act accordingly, meaning we don't believe. <laughs> we say we believe that there is this truth. and No, so we don't like belief actually. We, we say it, it's possible and you can, it's just not that successful. Your belief will be torn to shreds once contrary data. It's easy to believe in the lecture. It's very hard to believe when you're at a funeral for your loved ones. 
right? So that's the thing. It's, it, this world is very difficult to be in because you know, your loved ones are in danger. You're in danger. It's, it's scary. It's a scary world out there. It's not real, but it's hard to like understand that it's not real. So you need to have an experience that counters your previous experience. So first you have this realization. Um, I am not the body and mind, and it comes through nirvikalpa samadhi, which is your first real definitive experience of yourself as a spirit. Prior to this, you've just felt yourself as a body and mind. Now, the more you go into that, meaning if like imagine a bird diving into the ocean, the more you dive into that ocean of samadhi, the less and less real this world will seem to you. So you will start to articulate arguments that sound like this. This is Maya. And by Maya, we mean magic show. We mean illusion. We mean ignorance. The world is false and Brahman is real. In Nirvikalpa Samadhi alone is reality manifest. Outside of Nirvikalpa Samadhi, you live in a shadow world, a dream world. And you know what? Given that this is absolutely true, it, this truth must also be reflected. For it to be absolutely true, it must also be reflected from a relative point of view. So let's look at the ways in which this truth is true in your own life. And one of my favorite meditations here is the meditation on a memory as compared to on, as a, a, a dream. You know, so we just recently did a TikTok about this. Imagine a memory or, or visualize. See, imagine already my bias. Im, visualize a memory, right? Like what you had for lunch, something very mundane like that. What you had for lunch yesterday. And remember what you were eating, who you were with, where you were sitting, how it felt to be sitting there with those people eating that meal. Just replay that scene in your mind. Then consecutively replay another scene, this time from a dream. Imagine you are in a dream now and, and whatever memory, <laughs> I know. <laughs> and you know what, actually, it might be even harder if you take an emotionally charged memory, a memory that seems so real, that seems to have really, you know, like been such a, like your graduation or something, if that was important to you. Just imagine what it was like to be walking up the steps and receiving the thing, if, if indeed that was something you cared about. Or imagine, I don't know, what, what have you, some beautiful emotionally charged experience. Or even, dare I say, some dark, terrible experience. If you want the more hardcore metal version of this practice. And this is actually the therapeutic use. You can imagine that, revisit that, and then quickly imagine a dream. Or by imagine, I mean remember. Remember a dream. Remember a nightmare, a horribly emotionally charged nightmare you might have had. Or imagine a beautiful dream in which something very wonderful happened and compare the two. You know, if, you, if you're honest and you compare the two in your own experience now, I don't mean in meditation, I mean now, you'll be able to feel the similarity between a dream and a memory. And, and we know that we misremember things all the time. We're always making stuff up. So a memory is not that much more ontologically viable than a dream. They're both as illustrious as one another. And we're already ready to dismiss dreams. Most of us instinctively dismiss dreams. When we wake up, we instinctively say, ah, that was only a dream. So given that we're already dismissing dreams, we should get in the habit of dismissing um, memories too. Yeah, you know what? Abley, Abley, I hope I'm saying that right, is, is also spot on. You can actually, this is like the gaslighting thing, right? You can get people to visualize things that might never have happened and they might actually believe that it did happen, like implanting memories or something, a loftus paradigm, you know, the psychological. Anyway, so there are all these ways in which you can prove that you can just as, as readily and as easily invest a total fictional imagination construct with as much reality as the things that currently have reality, you know, it, it, that, that's the, the way to feel the truth of this world is unreal in our own experience. And we can also experience it in terms of getting the things that we wanted so badly, only to find out that they didn't satisfy us the way that we wanted to be satisfied. Right? That's one way in which we can realize that the things we thought were real weren't really that real. Another way to realize this is to realize that when I you know, worry about something and I'm really afraid something bad is going to happen to me, it's never quite as bad. Maybe it doesn't even happen. So I realized my worry was unreal or it happens and it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. My worrying about it is actually way worse than it itself. Another way to understand that things aren't real. The things that you want aren't real because when you get them, you're not satisfied. And the things that you fear aren't real because it's almost never as bad as you thought it would be. So this is, I guess, kind of a more psychological or mundane way of articulating this absolute spiritual truth that is experienced in the Samadhi of the Advaita Vedantins. The world is not real. The world, yes, Tarama is saying it perfectly, is nothing but a story. We are the ones who created it. Next week, I actually want to introduce you to some Ajatavada. Oh. Gaurapa, I'm not introduce you. I'm looking around the room and nobody's new here. You've all been here for a really long time. Um, and we had a whole class on this. It was called The World 
who, who created the world? No one or something like that. I forget what the title of the lecture was, but the argument is that God never created a world. I mean, we did. It's through ignorance only that this world appears, right? It's through ignorance only that this world appears. So we don't have to blame God for anything that appears here. Okay. So now we're going to enter into the next level of realization. And this we're calling the realization of Param Advaya. It's called many things. It's called Advaya. It's called Para Advaita. It's called Param Advaya. And it's a distinctly Shaiva doctrine of non-duality that was very prevalent amongst the writers of the ninth 10th and 11th centuries in Kashmir, in a valley called Srinagar. So there's a city, it's Srinagar, in, in, in a valley in Kashmir. And here we see a series of Kashmiri Shaiva masters. Um, maybe the first amongst them might have been Somananda, and then there was Vasugupta and Kalat, Kalatabhatta, and we're going to explore all of their works. But anyway, these are people who arguably have had a deeper experience of Samadhi. So they've gone a little deeper, you know, a little deeper. And they come out and they say, you know what they say? oh my God, this world is real. It's realer than I ever thought it was. So in the first stage, you say the world is real, right? In the second stage, you say the world is unreal. In the final stage, you say, damn, the world is real. But you don't say I was right the first time, actually. You don't actually in this final stage say, no, no, I had it in the beginning. No, no. Because the way you experience the reality of the world in this level of Samadhi is actually, I would argue, wholly apart from the way you experience the world is real at that level of Samadhi. So I would say, I would say it this way. That what you thought was real in the Charvaka first phase of your spiritual life is actually your story. What you took to be real was the story that you had about the world. Then in the second stage, what you realize that, this, which you realize that your stories aren't real right? So the stories that you had about the world aren't real. Then you're very excited about the statement, the world is unreal. But then you get to the final part of your realization, arguably final, but hard to say anything is final in the infinite God. But the next, let's just say next part of your realization is this. No, no, no. There is something about consciousness that gives rise to these stories. There's something about consciousness that inherently manifests stories that appear to me as a world. And you know what? It delights in that. This consciousness, this Shiva, this Atman, this Brahman is pulsating with a divine playfulness. There's an inherent beauty in it. There's an inherent curiosity, a childlike urge to play. And there's a personality inherent in this thing. So you go from this impersonal absolute to actually a very personal being, which you yourself are. So it's still non-duality. It's not that God's out there in the sky. You yourself are this being, but you sense that as an innate characteristic of this being, it wants to manifest the world. So it's not that the world is an illusion, rather the world is a creative manifestation or rather, I don't even want to say that that's actually not even true. You know, that's one level of the realization. This world is a creative manifestation. No, actually the highest level is, let me just give you a verse. Okay. The verse is this. Kumbho gatas cheti tataiva banyate. Maheshwaraha sarvam idam jagat viti. Now, in Sanskrit, when you're teaching someone Sanskrit, one of the classes is synonyms. You learn synonyms for the same thing. So, for instance, chakshu means eyes, but netra also means eyes. So, can anybody tell me what the difference is between the word chakshu and netra in terms of meaning? Do you know what the difference is? What's the difference between chakshu, which means eyes, and netra, which means eyes? What's the difference between these two words? Can anybody tell me? nothing. There's no difference. And you learn that. You learn these sets of synonyms, right? The Sanskrit language is full of words that mean the same thing. So it's good for you to know that. So netra, chakshu, um, aksha, a lot of these words, they mean the same thing. Yeah, it's a true question. There's another set of words, kumba. You've heard it, yoga. Some of you do hatha yoga. You've heard kumbhaka. Kumbhaka means breath retention, right? But the word kumba actually means pot. It means to create a pot, an emptiness in you by holding the breath. So kumbhaka, kumba means pot. Gata, gata, gata means pot. So what's the difference between kumba and gata? Nothing. Like chakshu and netra, kumba and gata, there are no differences between them whatsoever. They're the exact same thing. Two words for the exact same thing. So this is very important. It's a linguistic principle. It's very important that you understand this. Is there actually a difference between the word kumba and gata? Absolutely not. They're both signifiers signifying the same thing. They're both indicators and they're indicating the same thing. Now, the next part of the verse, kumbo 
gatas cheti tataiva banyate. Just as the words kumbha and gata are not different and both relate to the same thing. Second part of the verse. Maheshwaraha sarvamidam jagatviti. God and the world are not two different things. God and the world are two words for one thing. Paramashiva, Maheshwaraha. So that's the startling discovery. It's not that consciousness longs to manifest the world. I mean, yes, that's the poetic and artistic language that we use, but rather the world itself is nothing other than God. Just like heat, it doesn't, it's not like fire wants to shoot heat out. No, heat just is where fire, where, where fire is, heat is, right? There can never be fire without heat, okay? So insofar as that is true, the deepest kind of samadhi that Kashmiri Shaivas would argue is this, a samadhi in which you experience not just consciousness, but rather the inherent playful nature of consciousness that embodies itself or reflects itself in the experiences of the world. So interestingly, the way the world comes into being is not as an actual real transformation of consciousness. Rather, it's as like a reflection in a magic mirror. This we'll talk about next week. So I'm going to talk about creation in Kashmir Shaivism. So like, how did the world come into being? Why is there a world? How did it appear like that? That's what I want to discuss next week. Creation in Kashmir Shaivism. And we'll look at Ajata Vada and look at the arguments from the Advaita Vedantins for why the world doesn't exist. You know, and then we'll look at arguments from Kashmir Shaiva to show why the world does. And also, of course, we'll have to look at dualistic arguments. In fact, let's just do something like we did today, but we'll look at the creation stories from each of these different camps. The materialist, scientific materialist, the dualist, God created the world. Then we'll look at it from the point of view of non-dualist, God didn't create the world. The world is an appearance in God. And finally, we'll look at it from this very new point of view, this Paramadvaya, which argues something called Abhasa, which means the world is nothing but a reflection of this one consciousness. It's a shining forth of consciousness in a spirit of fun and play. So now notice what we're saying. We're not saying the world is real, but nor are we saying the world is unreal. This is called spiritual realism. And spiritual realism takes this experience to be true, to be valid, but um, the reason it's valid is not in and of itself. The reason it's valid is because it's an expression and a reflection of something that is valid. And that's the absolute truth, Parabhairava. Okay, so these I will call progressive stages of realization in Kashmir Shaivism. In fact, now I'm looking at the time where we're five minutes past one hour. I think we'll just call this lecture progressive stages of realization in Kashmir Shaivism, right? This lecture, that's what, that's what I'll call the lecture. But let me give you the arguments now, which will flesh out the difference a little more. So notice, in the Samadhi of Advaita Vedanta, so this is the formal end of this first part. I'm just going to add now some scriptural citations to compare the two. So in the Samadhi of the Advaita Vedantin, you end up with this kind of philosophy. Brahman alone is real, and the world that you see around you is not real. It's an appearance. It's an illusion. Brahma Satyam, Jagat Brahma. <laughs> Jagat Mitra. You know, so the world is Mitra. It's false. Brahma Satyam, Jagat Mitra. Mitya, Mitya, sorry, Mitya, Mitra, sorry, Mitya. Brahma Satyam Jagat Mitya. So the, the, the world is real. Brahman is Sat, real. The world is Mitya, false, illusion. Jiva, Brahmheva, Naparaha. And you and Brahman are not different. So this is one verse from a Shankara poem. Okay. The Brahman alone is real. The world is unreal. So how do you experience reality in Nirvikalpa Samadhi? Anytime you're outside of Nirvikalpa Samadhi, you're in illusion. So then, you know what this philosophy says it in, in order to account for the appearance of everything around you it has to say that some entity other than brahman is responsible for creating all of this and they call that entity avidya avidya means ignorance now ignorance is a very real phenomenon it must be why because it is the account for what you see before you so if i see a chair and i'm not seeing brahman I, as a philosopher, if I'm an Advaitin, have to explain how it is that I come to see a chair and not Brahman. If indeed Brahman is the only thing that exists, I should always be seeing Brahman. And you know, the beauty of Advaita Vedanta is that it argues for just this. The world that you previously thought was a world is nothing but God. That's why Swami Vivekananda says with such stern authoritarian beauty, he says, don't look for God, see God. You know, don't seek God, see God. Because the world that you see before you is nothing other than God. That's the ultimate claim of Advaita Vedanta. Advaita means non-duality. It's not Purusha and Prakriti. It's just Purusha. It's just Brahman. And Prakriti is an appearance. It's an appearance within Brahman. So anytime I see an appearance, I'm actually looking at the real thing. So take the case, Shankara's favorite example of the rope and the snake. 
Now, if I happen to see a snake in the dim pre-dawn light, it's not that there is an actual snake there. It's actually really a rope. I somehow, through my ignorance, have come to superimpose onto the rope a snake. So I'm seeing a snake. Where do I need to look in order to find the rope? Nowhere, right? I'm looking at it. I'm looking at the rope. I just think it's a snake. So all I have to do is remove my error called snake and I will see the rope. The same thing that I previously misapprehended as a snake, I now correctly apprehend as a rope. So what Advaita Vedanta in its most exalted, thrilling way is saying is that I'm actually already in touch with God. I don't need to like find God. It's here right now as, as all of these people, as this world. I, I don't need to seek God. I should just see God. However, I need to offer an account as to why that wasn't always true for me. You know, why, why was it that I needed Nirvikalpa Samadhi in order to realize this? Why wasn't I immediately aware of this? In other words, why don't I see a rope from the very get-go? Why did I see a snake at all? How did the snake come to be? And the answer is ignorance, right? I mean, just take that very mundane example. If I saw a snake, but really there was only a rope, who created the snake? Did the rope create the snake? Was it the rope's fault that I saw a snake? No, the rope was just there. The rope was a rope. It always was, always will be a rope. The rope never actually turned into a snake. There's no parinama. There's no actual transformation. There is only a vivarta, an appearance. So the rope through vivarta, a cause, cause and effect link called vivarta, an illusory cause, an illusory effect, appeared as a snake. But I am the fellow who put the snake there. I am the dolt that saw the rope as a snake. So the way to explain the existence of all of this, the way to account for many fullness in the Advaita Vedanta is to ascribe all of this to some basic beginningless principle called ignorance, avidya, ignorance. So I have to ask the question now, who created God? Who created me? Who created the world? What's the answer? How, who created any of these things? Ignorance, yes. You know, if someone asked, who created God? I can answer it. From the point of view of Advaita Vedanta, ignorance. <laughs> Swami Ashokananda makes a really good point. What you previously thought, no, actually not quite, Tejas, it's ignorance. Because if no one created God, then the question is, are you saying Brahman created God? Because Brahman is no one. But Brahman, are you saying that Brahman created God? No, cannot. Brahman doesn't do anything. See, be careful. In Advaita Vedanta, if you say that no one created it, then it should not be here. But it is here. Somebody has to explain why it's here. Uh, you did see a snake, not a rope. How to account for that? So you have to say ignorance. Ignorance created the snake. In other words, ignorance created what I experience as God, the world, and myself. So the Jiva, the Jagat, and Ishvara, all these three, or Bhagavan, all these three, are created by ignorance. So Swami Ashokananda Ji says beautifully, what you previously saw as God in ignorance, in knowledge you realize is the self. Anyway, only Brahman exists. Brahman appears to be God, world, and person. So these three, God, world, and person, aren't actually there. These three are the snake. What's really, really real is Brahman. Okay? So I, in my ignorance, created God. <laughs> I created a world. I created myself. Now, this would sound like atheism, except it's not, because there is a, 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 an overarching transcendental principle here. It's called Brahman. And that's what I truly am. Not Nish, but beyond that. Okay, you know this. Now, the next thing to understand is that avidya is beginningless. There is no start to avidya and there is no end to avidya. Avidya is beginningless. No, sorry. Oh my God. There is an end to avidya, thankfully. If there wasn't an end to avidya, we could not be having this conversation. <laughs> Whoops. There is no start to avidya, uh, but there is an end. And we can demonstrate this very simply. So consider your ignorance in something like, I don't know, how many of you language? Who? Like, it's okay. You can, it, okay, never mind. Don't, don't. Oh my God. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Now? Okay, good. That's funny. Okay, good. Because I asked a question that I realized is not a good question to ask. I was like, who is ignorant of the Sanskrit language? I'm like, wait, why would you out people like that? No, no, no. Don't raise your hands. So let's say, let's say there was a time when I didn't know any Sanskrit, right? I'm ignorant of the Sanskrit language. Now I have to ask a question. When did my ignorance of the Sanskrit language start? Can you trace that point where my ignorance of the Sanskrit language started? It's impossible. My ignorance of the Sanskrit language seems to be beginningless. I seem to have always been ignorant of the Sanskrit language until I wasn't, you know? 
Right. Uh, but, you know, if you say that, if you say the beginning of my ignorance of the Sanskrit language was when I was born, you know what? You know what you're actually saying? You're saying that you knew it before you were born, which means you knew the Sanskrit language before you knew the Sanskrit language, which is a contradiction. You know, you, then you cannot say your ignorance started there because you knew the Sanskrit language. You could say maybe you forgot the Sanskrit language. Maybe you could use some reincarnation argument here. Yeah, but you don't know that, right? It, you don't know that you knew the Sanskrit language in a previous life. You don't, you don't know that you knew the Sanskrit language in a previous life. But you know when you know that you know the Sanskrit language? When you actually learn it in this life. So if you go to your first class and you learn uh, uh, e, e, u, u, you know, you learn like the, 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 the stuff when you start to learn the Sanskrit language, um, then you're like, oh, my ignorance ended. So I cannot actually put a point at, as to when my ignorance began. Even if I say it's at birth, Actually, I don't know for sure whether before my birth I knew the Sanskrit language, you know. And even if I have a past life memory of knowing the Sanskrit language, I have to ask the question before that. So when was that person ignorant of the Sanskrit language? You see, anyway, in any case, it's clear that this avidya is beginningless. It does have an end. And of course, that end is when you realize the truth. So when you go to that first class and you learn some, some Sanskrit, the end of Sanskrit ignorance occurs. So while avidya has an end, it does not have a beginning. This sounds a lot like the prakriti of Sankhya, which is also beginningless and endless, right? Purusha is beginningless and endless. Prakriti is beginningless and endless. Avidya at least has an end. Prakriti doesn't have an end. Purusha's participation in Prakriti has an end. Anyway, so now, you know what Abhinav Gupta is going to argue? He's going to argue this is not really non-duality. It's not really non-duality. Why isn't it non-duality? Because there are two entities being discussed. One is called Brahman and the other is called Avidya. And Brahman is not the cause of the world. Avidya is the cause of God, the cause of the world, and the cause of the person. Avidya seems to be a very, I mean, dare I say, real, beginningless entity that is the cause, an actual cause, for what appears to be an actual effect. Now, you can argue that in final analysis, there wasn't a real cause, nor was there a real effect, but that doesn't account for why there appears to be. So really, I'm not asking who created the world. I'm asking, how can you account for the appearance of the world at all? And the Advaitin would be forced to say, Avidya, they have to. I mean, it would be ridiculous if they denied the appearance entirely. They have to say, yes, I am seeing a world. I'm misapprehending Brahman for this world. Um, and the reason I'm doing it is because of ignorance. So ignorance or cosmic nations is like an entity. It's like a tatwa almost. Now let's look what Abhinava Gupta is going to do with this. I'm going to give you a quote here. From Ishvara Pratya Bhikhya Vivriti Vimashni, one of the most important theoretical works of Kashmir Shaivism ever. I'm going to put it in the chat. So Timothy will be happy. Here we go. So this is the word. This is the, the, the phrase, okay? Brahma Pishtam Avidyaya Shahatato Naikanta Vado Pyapyam. Naikanta, Anta means end, right? So Avidya is described as a beginningless element. So since Brahman is described as having avidya as another beginningless element along with him, this cannot be accepted as a monistic doctrine. Here's where it starts. Uh, Abhinava Gupta and other philosophers too, like uh, Vallabha, you know, the Shrudadvaita philosopher Vallabha. Many philosophers have actually looked at Shankara's Advaita and said, look, if you're carefully, carefully investigating it, you'll realize it's not non-duality. There are two things here. Just like how in Sankhya, there was clear, and, and Sankhya, they, they, they'll admit it. A Sankhyan will say, yes, there are two things. There are two eternal categories. One is Purusha and one is Prakriti. By the way, how are we doing? We're okay out there. Do you mind if I just do a little bit? I just wanted to finish them. Okay, thank you. So I know, I know we're like I'm 75 minutes in and I know it's pretty heavy and there's like a lot to think about. And I know we should do these in smaller chunks, but just because I said I would, let me do it. Okay. And we'll, we'll revisit it in Q&A and also next week. So here's the first thing, the first, first claim. Advaita doesn't seem like true non-duality. Why? Because just like Sankhya, it seems to be proposing two things. A beginningless, endless Purusha and a beginningless, endless Prakriti. Of course, Avidya has an end, unlike Prakriti, but like Prakriti, it's also beginningless. and It also seems to be a thing. It must be because something, it can't be no one, something must be there to account for all of this. Because I am, this is the fact, I am seeing it. So you can't deny the fact. You can't just pretend you're not seeing a world, you know? You can't pretend that you've never been deluded into thinking a table is a table and not Brahman. You saw a table, you didn't see Brahman, why? If it was Brahman, why did you see a table and not Brahman? What is a table? 
who created the table and why does there seem to be so many of them if indeed you have a non-dual philosophy right so basically this is the question of if there is only one why do i see many even if you say the many is an appearance you must give me an account as to why the many appears at all and the vedantin will say the many never appeared it's not now here it only seems to appear because of this thing called avidya and that's not a real thing avidya is not an actual thing it's just and they'll, they'll probably become quiet here okay because it's very hard to say what avidya is you can't actually say what it is because in trying to say what it is you affirm that it is the advaita vedantin cannot make this mistake because if the advaita vedantin describes avidya they have thereby affirmed that there is such a thing called avidya <laughs> So do you see this logical contradiction? On one hand, you are saying that this entire phenomenal, phenomen, phenomenal existence is arising from cosmic nations, avidya. And then you are saying that there is no such thing as avidya. But that would only work if there was no appearance. So you're not yet able to account for why there's an appearance. And if I ask you what avidya is, you're unable to tell me because you're afraid that by telling me, by describing avidya, you're going to reify it as something. Weasel sneaking out of this debate. This is, can you see it's, it's squirreling out, right? It's a clear attempt at squirreling out of a debate. It's saying there is a thing, it's called avidya, and it account, this is the account for why a world exists. Okay, now explain that thing. No, 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 there's no thing. What are you talking about? I couldn't be a thing. I'm non dualist I'm non dualist only Brahman. No. See? Something is wrong here. Something is deeply inconsistent. When it's convenient, you say, when I ask you why there is a world, you conveniently say there is something called avidya and you conveniently posit that the world arises from it. Then when I press you on this and say, so have you given me two entities now, Brahman and avidya? You immediately backpedal and say, no, avidya is not a thing. Okay, which is it? Either it's a thing that causes the appearance of all of this, or it's not a thing. And in the second case, I'm sorry, Mr. Advaita Vedanta, you have not offered me an account for why this appears. This is the main problem that Abhinav Gupta finds with uh, Advaita Vedanta. There's just no real account and there are too many inconsistencies. So therefore, in this verse, you see him saying, Brahma Pishtam Avidyaya Shaha Tato Naikanta Vado Pyapyam Vado Pyayam. Okay, since Brahman is described as having Avidya as another beginningless element, this cannot be accepted as a monistic doctrine. This cannot be Shuddha Advaita. It cannot be pure non-duality. It's non-duality with some adventitious element called an Upadi, right? Maya is the Upadi of Brahman. Okay, by the way, we're talking in a cosmic sense, but we could speak in an individual sense too. If I am Brahman, my body and mind is my upadi. Why do I think I'm a body and mind? Because of avidya. So now I'm two things. I'm Brahman with my avidya. And that avidya causes me to think that I'm a body and mind. Okay, so remember, any, anything macro can be discussed micro. Okay, now I'm going to give you this next verse. Also from Ishvara Pratya Bhikya Vivritti Vimarshini. I gave you a verse from the third chapter, but now I'm going to give you a verse from the first chapter. Avidya... This is a contradiction. What's the contradiction? On one hand, you say that avidya is indescribable and yet brings about the manifestation of diversity. Is that not itself a description? I kind of glossed this a little earlier. So on one hand, you say avidya is the indescribable source of everything. Then on the other hand, you've described it as the source of everything. So which is it? Is it indescribable or is it describable? It must, I mean, what, <laughs> you can't say something is indescribable and then describe it as the cause of all this manifold appearance. You know, so that's what uh, Abhinava Gupta is going to say. Avidya, chanir vachya, vaichitriyam, chad hatte, iti vyahatam. This is a contradiction. Yeah. Okay, let's keep going along this line. And now he's going to elaborate on it. So the next thing that I'm, I'm going to put in the chat here, the next quotation. It doesn't, I'm not able to kind of chop it up nicely. Brahmano hi vidyaika rupasya. Vidya eka rupa. Vidyaika rupasya, meaning knowledge in and of itself. Katam avidya rupata. So if Brahman is said to be, I don't know how to translate this, but maybe pure knowledge, knowledge in and of itself, the principle of knowing itself. So since Brahman is pure knowledge, how then can it assume the form of ignorance? Avidya rupata. If ignorance is the opposite to, to knowledge, and if Brahman is itself knowledge, how can Brahman ever assume the form of avidya? How could Brahman be avidya rupata? How could it be like ignorance? And also, on the other hand, 
um, na, cha, na chanya kaschit, na chanya kaschit asti vastuto jivadir yasya vidya bhave. Jiva meaning individual, right? So on the other hand, there is no one other than Brahman to whom ignorance could have occurred, right? So Brahman itself cannot be ignorant, but who can? If nobody other than Brahman exists, it's unclear as to who this ignorance, to whom this ignorance occurs. <laughs> Do you see the other paradox? I'm ignorant. I see Brahman. I, I don't see Brahman. I see a world. So I exist. No, no, no. Brahman alone exists. Oh, so Brahman is ignorant. No, no, no. Brahman can't be ignorant. Come on. What are you, what are you doing here? This is too sneaky. This is be clear. You know, give me an answer. Am I ignorant or am I not? No, you don't exist. Then why the ignorance? It doesn't exist. Then why do I see it? I don't know, Maya, right? So that's another, another way in which Abhinava Gupta um, argues. Now he's going to, this is the last thing I'll put in the chat. Last thing that we're going to look at. I don't know if this will all paste here, but let's try. Yeah, it did. Oh my God, it looks awful, but <laughs> let's go through it. It was all spaced out nicely on the Discord. So it's not quite doing that, but that's okay. So let's look at this. This, this one is actually really juicy. Now he's going to debate. He's going to take an argument. So one thing you do in Indian scripture when you're debating against people from other schools or whatever, you take arguments, you present those arguments, and then you present refutations. You present arguments, and then you present your own refutations that you expect them to make, you know, like rejoinders, and then you respond to those rejoinders. This is just a kind of convention in philosophy. So let's see. Now, in Ishvara Pratya Bhikya Vivritti Vimashni, I think this is book two. If it is said that, and here's the quote, Samvid Rupam Brahma Abhinam Chakastya Vikalpake Vikalpa Bhalatu Bhedhoyam, which means Brahman, and this is Samvid Rupam, which means pure consciousness. So Brahman, who is pure consciousness, shines alone. Here the word Abhinam. Abhinam means to shine. So Brahman alone, Brahman, pure consciousness alone, shines in Nirvikalpa Samadhi as the one true entity. So now this is referring to a meditative experience as we described a few moments ago. So this Brahman alone shines forth as um, the one true principle of existence. Diversity, the appearance of this manifold world, is simply due to, and I don't know how to translate Vikalpa. Vikalpa means thinking, storytelling. It means, let's just say, let's say mental ideation. You know, one scholar called this mental ideation. I like that. So mental ideation is the cause of the diversity. Okay. So that's typically what Advaita Vedanta will argue or say, only in Nirvikalpa Samadhi is truth fully present. When you come out of Nirvikalpa Samadhi and you happen to see a world again, this shadowy world of, of appearances, it's the result of mental ideation. So this is the argument. This is how they account for the world. Just another way of saying ignorance. I also like this, by the way, any kind of thinking is ignorant. So in fact, I would inverse what Timothy said. It's not that all lies are true lies. I would say all truths are really lies because anything the mind can think is false, right? Like everything that the mind thinks, thinking itself is error. Thinking itself, I, I love that, that phrasing. Any, any kind of thought is wrong. So the only truth is a post-thinking world. You know, like just like don't think, just be. So interestingly, mental ideation is another way of saying avidya, ignorance, maya. Okay, so this world is result of mental ideation. So now look at the response. The response will be, um, where is it? Okay, then in response we say, then in response we say, kasyayam vikalpa navyaparo nama brahmanaschet avidya yogo na chan yosti. So <laughs> this, this question, kasyayam vikalpa vikalpa navyaparo nama. Then, then who is thinking? Right? Like who conducts such mental ideation? If it's Brahman who is conducting such mental ideation, then Brahman is the one who is tainted by avidya. So if Brahman is the one who is thinking, you've now given some property to Brahman called thinking. Brahman now acts, which is weird. Um, so how can Brahman be the one conducting this mental ideation? But who exists other than Brahman who could be conducting it? So there's no one other than Brahman who could be doing this mental ideation. So you see, these are the ways in which Abhinava Gupta corners the Advaita Vedanta. And, and, and I want to make one final point. He's not cornering Shankara or Gaudapada. Actually, the Kashmir Shaivas, they saw Shankara and Gaudapada as tantrikas through and through. They actually really believed that Shankara and Gaudapada, actually, they had the highest realization. 
And some scholars will say, well, you know, you have to remember that Shankara wrote this stuff in his early 20s and he, he died very young. So he didn't have time to like refute or stick around. Also, they say, remember, Shankara's main purpose was to argue against Buddhists. The Buddhists and the Advaita Vedantins both shared many logical inconsistencies. But because they had these inconsistencies in common, they left them untouched since the debate could still happen without resolving those inconsistencies. So notice that they actually, Kashmir Shaivas are actually really, really generous to Shankara and Gaurapada. You know who they take issue with is Shankara's followers. Like after Shankara, there came a slew of logicians like Shiharsha, who in one place actually says that logic is more important than practice as BN Pandit reports, you know? So he's actually arguing against a slew of logicians who are basing their entire logic off of these principles, Brahman and Avidya. And here, Abhinava Gupta is saying, this is leading you astray. This is not helpful. It's not helpful to think of it in terms of Brahman and Avidya. This is not the true and accurate representation of the ultimate reality. So this is how Abhinava Gupta tackles and deals with the Buddhist and Advaita logicians, Advaita Vedanta logicians that came after Shankara. Now, this is very important. In Ishvara Pratya Bigya Vivitri Vimarshini, book three, verse 405, or rather chapter three, verse 405, you know what Shank uh, uh, Abhinava Gupta says? He says the words are not important. If you take Brahman and you take the word Maya, but you accept that Maya is the creative power whereby Brahman manifests itself as the world, then we have no issue. In other words, you don't have to accept our language of Shiva and Shakti because we don't mean a blue guy or a tiger lighting, riding women, woman. You can use the word Brahman and Maya. You just have to understand that Brahman and Maya, you have to work with these principles in a different way. Okay. And he says the same for Lord Buddha. He says Lord Buddha also had this realization. It's just his followers misunderstood. So notice, this is a very beautiful and inclusive and tolerant view, which is very rare, actually, in some of these Indian schools. Sometimes you find that although India has never had any religious bloodshed before the Mughal invasion, which I think is a startling fact. You know, in Indian history, there have been wars, bloodthirsty wars, like Ashoka, you know, launched horrible wars against like kingdoms, like what is it, Kali, I forget, but Kalinga, right? He lost, brutal war against Kalinga. Anyway, so there have been wars in India, but they've never been about religion. Never, not one religious war in India prior to the Mughal invasion of the 13th century. That's to me just mind blowing that people in India never killed each other over these things. But they did become pretty dogmatic in their debates. I think the reason they didn't kill each other is because they had such a healthy and strong debating culture that was so willing to hear what other people had to say. I think it's because everyone was a practicing mystic and you didn't have like, you know, religious demagogues who were peddling beliefs and preying upon people's weaknesses. So there's a lot of reasons why India didn't have religious wars prior to Mughal invasion. One of the reasons is healthy debate. In the debates though, some people will take the position that their school is actually superior to other schools. And here, Abhinava Gupta, although he is clearly arguing against the deficiencies that he finds in the Advaita Vedantin logic and the Buddhist logic, although he's clearly positioning Kashmir Shaivism as a school wholly distinct from all of those, although he's doing that, he's still making room for all of these other schools by saying they too can come to the same realization. They, they too can, can describe it in whatever words they want to describe it. What's important though, is that you don't label this creation as an ignorance. Rather, Rather, you describe it as a creative manifestation. So that's what we're going to talk about next week. Okay, next week, we're going to talk about creation stories uh, in scientific materialism, in dualistic religion, in um, Advaita Vedanta, particularly Gaurapada, and finally in Kashmir Shaivism. Next week, we'll ask the question, why is anything here at all? And I'm going to make the case that it's all here for art. It's all here for play. It's all part of a principle called spanda, the creative oscillation of awareness, whereby it reflects itself in all of this. So that's coming up next week. Um, okay, I think I'm quite satisfied with this. Not so bad, 90 minutes. That's not worse than previous lectures. Not better, but it's not worse. Okay, let's call it a day. Thank you, everyone. Let's chant and, and close the practice. And I'm going to chant now a little bit from Tantra Loka, just a phrase from Abhinava Gupta's Tantra Loka. Om Kintu Durgata Karitvat Svachandya Nirmaladaso Svatma Prachadana Krida Pandita Parameshwaraha Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tatsat Shri Ram Krishna Rapanamastu Om Om Lord Shiva, you are ever skilled in disguising yourself as this multiplicity. In your innate freedom, 
and in your innate purity you play this game of hide and seek om may this be an offering to you om salutations to you who are even now my very own essence nature consciousness saturated with bliss om peace peace peace